Um, the title of my talk is Beyond the Cadillac Desert. Um, um, in fact, I toyed with that as a title for the book because Cadillac Desert, um, I think more than any work of contemporary literature, has sort of defined the narrative here in the West. And as a journalist, as a storyteller, I'm really interested in the narratives, the stories we tell, because they influence how we act and how we behave. And Cadillac Desert, um, really created this narrative when it came out 30 years ago of sort of conflict and crisis and mistakes and doom. And it's a very personally important narrative to me because when you're a journalist, we thrive on conflict, we thrive on crisis, and we thrive on doom. And um, those narratives drive a lot of the public understanding and the public perceptions of how we think about and deal with and solve our water problems. Um, and um, I think Cadillac Desert, it's a great book, but you can't be in the position I'm in trying to write about water in the Colorado River Basin in the West in the 21st century um, without confronting it. Um, but I have a, come to the conclusion in the work that I've been doing on water for many years that a lot of what we think we understand because we embrace the Cadillac Desert um, narrative is wrong. Um, and I want to talk about why I think that and what I think these new narratives um, need to be. For my personal story, um, um, I um, grew up in the Colorado River Basin. Now, that doesn't make sense because I grew up in Los Angeles in Southern California, but if you look at the Colorado River Compact, um, Colorado River Compact defines the Colorado River Basin as, um, I take my glasses to read this, the, the drainage area of the basin and all other territory within the United States of America to which the waters of the Colorado River system shall be beneficially applied. So I grew up in a little town in Southern California called Upland, which is, when I grew up in the 1960s, was on the fringe of the suburbs, citrus farming um, region. A little tiny uh, water company, the San Antonio Water Company, delivered our water, which was part of a larger um, conglomerate of water agencies, which spanned a couple of groundwater basins, which is part of the Metropolitan Water District of Southern California. This area was annexed into Met in 1951, before I was born. So I grew up in the Colorado River Basin. I didn't think about this at the time, because when you live in Los Angeles, you don't think about that. Um, I later moved to Albuquerque. Um, I've lived most of my adult life in Albuquerque, which is in the Colorado River Basin. We take salmon water, we bird across the mountains. Um, and, um, and I live, in fact, what I think is arguably the southernmost water-using part of the upper Colorado River Basin. Those pictures on the left are a friend of mine, Corky Hort, on a alfalfa farm. He's growing alfalfa in the upper basin water down in sort of central New Mexico in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, and one of the first interviews I did when I was working on this book was Pat. And she made this point, which you heard her make again today, which is that we have created, through this interconnected system of water management, one giant watershed. And we have to think about the fact that we are sharing this one single giant watershed. And if we're going to solve our problems, we have to solve them by embracing the fact that we're all sharing this and we have to work it at that large scale. So how do the stories get in the way? There's a great um, piece written this summer by a geographer at the University of uh, Wisconsin-Madison, a guy named Daniel Brandt, who wrote an essay that, that captured some of the problems, which is that, that there is this, he was talking about the California drought. And if you follow the California drought in the news, you've seen pictures of cracked reservoir mud and dry um, irrigation canals. And, and what, um, what Grant described is a, a genre of apocalyptic prophecy that functions by diagnosing a human misalignment with nature and foresees a future in which nature, as a kind of secular deity, punishes our errant behavior. And this is a really powerful narrative. If you follow the, the coverage by people in my industry coming out of California, that's what you see. You see these pictures of cracked mud. And when I was working with the newspaper, we were writing about drought in New Mexico because we've had 15 very dry years on the Rio Grande. We got really good at this. My photographers and I, we'd sit down with the stream gauges and figure out where the river was dry, send somebody out, get a cracked mud picture, go with my 
uh, stories, and you know they would they would they were really good at finding the dead fish next to the you know shrinking pond and cracked mud. Um, but and, and so I grew up on that Cadillac Desert narrative, and that's what drove my journalism. But over time, as I watched New Mexico go through a pretty significant period of drought, what I kept seeing over and over again was, in fact, I kept looking for the, the people running out of water. Right? My friend Corky's doing fine. He's making good money, 700 acres down in, uh, in uh, uh, Santa Cosha in central New Mexico. He's getting enough water. They're figuring out how to put enough water on his farm. He's adapting to shortages when they happen, and, and Corky's, Corky's doing great. And I realized that trying to understand that piece of the story, where that adaptive capacity comes from, and how we successfully adapt when the water gets scarce, um, was really the central story that needed to be told. Not that we're going to run out, but that we're figuring out how to not run out, and how to have successful communities and lives across a rich range of, of sort of the society that we've got here in the West. And, and so I've come to the conclusion that there, what we have as a result of not just Cadillac Desert, but Chinatown, and the whole genre of this literature, and this narrative that has given us myths, and these myths are dangerous and they get in the way. And I want to go through what I think are the key ones. The myth number one is we're going to run out of water. And, and I, in my research for my book, I've gotten an amazing collection of these headlines. Um, this is from the Los Angeles Times, 1960. Uh, Southern California has 10 years of water left. Um, this was the year after I was born. Um, Southern California is still doing fine. The population in the sort of three county region, San Diego, Orange, and LA, has doubled in this time, and they haven't run out of water yet. Um, but there's a lot of headlines like that. And, and so it's this sort of projection of, of doom. And there's a great graph from the Bureau of Reclamation's um, uh, basin study that illustrates this story. I used to love this graph and I've come to really hate it. So on the left side is us using water and you know if you go to water conferences, I was at one at the University of Colorado Boulder a couple of years ago, I had kind of 13 different versions of this slide and talks over a two day period. Um, on the left side, you see water use rising, the Colorado River supply dropping, and then the basin study pro projected demand, and it's that rising orange curve. And what the, what the Bureau did was ask the states of the basin, how much water do y'all think you can need? And everybody said, oh, we're gonna need a lot. We need to grow. And it, there, was a, there was this sort of fiction in the effort, but that projection um, became fixed in people's mind that what we need to have the life we have lives up on that top orange line, and what nature is going to provide is on that bottom blue line. And this became this sort of prophecy of crisis and this prophecy of doom. Well, that's crazy, obviously. You can't use negative water. That's, that's not going to happen. So, so, so that's myth number one, is we're going to run out. I mean, obviously, we can't. Um, myth number two, whiskeys for drinking, water's for fighting over. I don't know how many times you've heard this. Stand in water crevices. First of all, Mark Twain never said it. Um, Alex Breitler, who's a, one of the posse of water journalists in the West, who works for the Stockton Record, actually worked with a Twain scholar and they <laughs> tracked down through Twain literature. It seems to have first appeared in the 1960s, well after Twain's death. Um, but, more, but more importantly, um, if, you, if you look at the history both here in the United States and around the world, there's some great work by a guy named Aaron Wolf um, at Oregon State. In fact, in these places where we have to share water and water becomes scarce, it is far more common to see collaborative frameworks and institutions and relationships develop. In fact, sometimes water becomes a catalyst for broader cooperation across national boundaries, across regional boundaries, far more often in Wolf's data set from around the world is water for collaborating over, which is not nearly as catchy a phrase, but, um, um, but, but reflects the reality. So, so the next time you see a journalist pulling this out, think to yourself, they're not thinking very hard about these problems. There's a second myth, with that, which, or a second part of this myth, um, which I call sort of myth 2A because I think it's a part of the manifestation problem. It's this notion that we all believe the truism that water flows uphill to money. Um, and 
in my book, I've been spending a bunch of time over the last year in two different geographies that I'm going to try to describe how they use water in my book. One is Las Vegas, and one is Yuma, Arizona. I've grown incredibly fond of Yuma. I still have a touchy relationship with Las Vegas, but uh, <laughs> but but that's super fond of Las Vegas. But I get that a lot of people love it and want to be there. Um, but but Las Vegas, if you look at the casinos around the Bellagio Fountain you got probably $4 billion worth of income, gaming, food, and restaurant, I mean, gaming, food, and hotel bills, just in the casinos that you can stand there at the Bellagio County and look around. It's four billion. Go down to Yuma, and there's the Yuma County, which is a really rich agricultural region. This is where a lot of your little lettuce is coming from. Um, Yuma and then across the river in Imperial, and all the lettuce goes through these crazy packing sheds, and, in winter, and literally all the lettuce goes through the packing sheds in Yuma. Um, the Yuma County Water Users Association, which is one of six irrigation districts, its consumptive use last year was greater than Las Vegas's. So, um, more money in Las Vegas, the total water use in Yuma County, the, the irrigation districts down there is three times as much as Las Vegas now. Um, you know, I think Pat would tell you that. Um, going and getting Yuma's water was never an option for her. Um, her community had a lot more money. The water still flows to Yuma. Um, and if you look at, ag at agriculture across the West using sort of 70, 80 percent of the developed water, the city's using some smaller fraction. Clearly, the water's not flowing up the money or we wouldn't be having the kinds of discussions that we're having. Um, but when people think the water flows up to money, this gets us into fighting mode and this creates you know, this goes hand in hand with, you know, whiskeys for drinking and waters for fighting. So, so I want to go back to some of these myths in more detail and look at what's happening in the stories where people are using less water. And I want to start with this absolutely fabulous paper by Peter Glick at the um, Pacific Institute of Publishing Seas and National Academy in uh, 2010. And what you've got here is the graphs of U.S. water use and U.S. GDP economic productivity for all across the 20th century as our economy grew, as our population grew, as our, our water use grew. I mean, right around the 1970s, the, the grass split. And this is what economists and natural resource specialists call decoupling. What, we, what has happened here in the United States, and it's really an appreciated story and really critical to us understanding how to solve our water problems, is that water use and economic activity have become decoupled. I'm going to give you some examples of that and how that happens at local scale. It happens differently in different geographies, in different economies, in different ways. But this decoupling is an incredibly important um, phenomenon. Um, because what it shows is, in fact, this is, what, this is how you go about not running out of water, right? We, when there is less water, we use less water, and we still do a pretty good job of doing the stuff that, um, that we want to do. So um, this is some data from the, the, that I've worked up for my book from Las Vegas. There's this amazing decoupling that happens around 1990. You know, has talked about the, the long buyback programs and the conservation effort, but um, I'm sorry, around 2000, the decoupling happens. Las Vegas's water use has dropped. Las Vegas is a 300,000 color acre foot Colorado river allocation. They're down to they're around 220, 225 right now. They're leaving the water on the table. Um, they're not really leaving it. They're managing what they do with that. I think pretty interestingly, but population has continued to grow. Um, water use has declined. Las Vegas decided it, as a community had to use less water, but it still wanted to do what it wants to do. Um, and it succeeded at that. Um, Las Vegas, I think, is this wonderful success story. You know, people want to criticize Las Vegas for growth. And one of the options might have been, we're not going to grow anymore. Las Vegas made its decision about what it wanted as a community, figured out how to do it within the available water supply. And if you look at Las Vegas's water numbers, and, and I'll give you some other cities in a minute, Las Vegas has a lot more room to push that curve down as it needs to. Las Vegas has, still has a long way to go. Um, so Las Vegas has figured out how, it's weird to think you know, the word sustainable has this sort of connotation in our site. Think about Las Vegas as sustainable. But Las Vegas has figured out how to be sustainable within the water supply that's available. Uh, my hometown of Albuquerque is a remarkable success story. Um, 
1995, when we began a water conservation effort in earnest, we were using 250 gallons per capita per day. This year, I was just talking recently with one of my friends who's the water conservation officer for the city, Captain Newbuck. Captain said, it looks like we're going to come in at 125. So, um, we have cut our per person water use in half in 20 years. And we've done it with, you know, lawn buyback programs and water conservation uh, um, sort of programs. But there also has been this thing that you can see happening in both Las Vegas and, and Albuquerque, where there has been this community shift in attitude toward water and the use of water. So, so we are using, um, you know, we're proud to be way, way ahead of Las Vegas here. Uh, we're using the same amount of water that we were using in the 1980s with a population that's nearly doubled in size. Um, um, so, so, so Albuquerque is a remarkable success story, and and if if Las Vegas gets down to the same kind of per capita numbers. It's really hard to compare per capita numbers for communities because of the way they're calculated. But actually, Las Vegas and Albuquerque come closer in terms of the way return flows are accounted. Um, you know, I, there's some some sort of calculations that, that I've been doing for the book suggest Las Vegas has room for a century of growth if they're willing to get down to Albuquerque numbers within their Colorado River allocation. Um, um, this is I love this one. This is uh, a groundwater. Um, monitoring well it's around the corner from my house so it's the one i always watch this is albuquerque's aquifer rising 2008 is when we shifted away from excessive groundwater pumping um, and the aquifer so this is like the aquifer under my house i love this um it's about 20 feet um, enormously successful and using that aquifer which provides a drought buffer so that we have it available um, um, and, and you see this um, you know in lots of cities around the west Arizona is another place. Arizona's um, uh, water use, Arizona has a bad reputation for water use, but Arizona's water use peaked in 1980. Arizona's population has um, more than doubled since. Agricultural productivity in Arizona as farmers adjust, changing the kind of cropping they do. Um, Arizona's agricultural productivity in inflation adjusted dollars has been relatively stable. Agriculture is using a lot less water. Um, Arizona, in part, imported Colorado River water, but Arizona's groundwater pumping reduction, according to the U.S. Geological Survey data, has gone down more than the increase in surface water. Um, the aquifers in sort of the, the places they decided to care about, the Phoenix Tucson area, aquifers are stable and rising. Um, so again, Arizona is an enormous success story. One of the most interesting ones to me is down in Imperial, um, the Imperial Valley. 3 million acre feet, by far the biggest sort of single chunk of Colorado River water use anyway, uh, anywhere. Jennifer talked about the quantification of settlement agreement. Um, people in Imperial will tell you that they are doing water conservation with a gun to their head, but the farmers don't have a gun to their head. They're being economically incentivized. Um, the grass here are a little more subtle, but water use in the last 10 years since the QSA, last a little more than a decade since the QSA, was implemented. Water use is down half a million acre feet. They were using right before the QSA 3.1 million acre feet. They're down to two and a half right now. Agricultural productivity is up. Farmers are smart, clever people. When faced with the opportunity to be incentivized for conserving water in the case of Imperial, um, they're doing a remarkable job and demonstrating what success um, can look like. Um, in, the, in this sort of tense environment. Uh, tractor dealers are still in business, throwing onions in the Imperial Valley. Um, and what has happened down there in Imperial is kind of an interesting case study in whether water should fight over or not. Because what you've seen is a bunch of really ugly litigation and a bunch of really kind of bashing together um, between the urban agencies and Imperial, between the federal government and Imperial. Um, between everybody at Imperial, at least that's how one of the people that I've talked to a lot at Imperial describes them as an island nation. Um, um, but the fact is that all these conflicts that were in lit on litigation paths, the people involved realized the litigation path was um, 
not in their best interest, and they've come up with these sometimes uncomfortable, often difficult, negotiated solutions, agreements um, that have this sort of collaborative flair um, that I think you know shows how these things can be done. So, so I you know wander around the West being the optimist in this situation. Um, and people show me this and talk to me about this. It's like, that's all great, John, but like, it's still empty, right? Like, so we haven't done enough. And I love the fact that people are finally willing to talk about the structural deficit. Um, that was, I, I still have had people in the Bureau say, well, yeah, I don't like that word, but you know, even the Bureau is coming around. And the structural deficit basically says there's more water being at, at a, minimum legal release of 8.23 in that period. There's more water going out of Lake Mead than coming in. And if there is not some giant bonus water thrown into the system by nature, um, Lake Mead keeps dropping. And, and as that Jennifer talked about um, this morning, when you get to those lower lake, lake levels in Lake Mead, the problems come on fast and furious, and um, the difficulties are more profound. So the question I'm posing that I'm trying to explore in my book is, when we're confronted with scarcity, we've shown again and again in Albuquerque, in Arizona, in Las Vegas, in Imperial, in Yuma, the human people. Great, they're using less water without even getting paid for it. They're using three quarters of a million acre feet less water than they were 20 years ago and just making money with it. Um, um, so the question is, where does that adaptive capacity come from? And you can see in communities' response to signals of their own scarcity and vulnerability. You can see the negotiated agreements among people at boundaries around water areas. And, and so the question is, how do we encourage and nurture that and and how do we scale this up because we've been able to solve these problems which all look really hard but when you compare them to the um, problems facing the basin especially with climate change um, it's not enough it's not it's not at the right scale and so we have to do a couple of things and one of the things we need to do is recognize scarcity and, and I have had people tell me that one of the success, things that helps explain Las Vegas' success is that it is physically located next to Lake Mead. And so if you live in Las Vegas and you have a boat, um, you can see it drop. And there's this sort of visceral relationship. I, 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 it's, it's, a, it's a neat narrative. I, I think it's right. I'm not sure it's right. But scarcity signals matter. Um, and so thinking about these images, which sort of runs counter to my narrative at the beginning, because maybe pictures of crack might help um, in that regard. Um, there's actually some data that suggests that all these crack mud newspaper stories, in fact, help people conserve. So maybe I'm completely wrong with it. But, but the really important thing is not to be tricked by the orange line on that graph. Don't think that you have to be on that orange line in order to protect your way of life, the life of your community, the life of your farm district, the life of your city, that recognize the fact that you can, in fact, and we have demonstrated over and over again that these communities can use less water. Because if you think you're good, you, you have to be on that orange line, you're gonna go to the bunkers and fight, and water will be for fighting over, and the system can crash really badly in ways that may preserve your position on the orange line at the expense of, of, of a Yuma or Imperial or Las Vegas having to disappear completely. Um, recognize that you can get off that, um, that orange line. So, so I love the newest version from the Bureau of Reclamation of this same graph. Terry Folt has started using this in, in his talks. Um, they changed the colors. Um, but, <laughs> but look what's happened, right? So, so five years ago, we asked all the states, how much water do you all need? And they said, what do you need to be up on? It's now a yellow line. We need all that water. Um, and in fact, the yellow, the, the, the yellow line on the left is what's actually happened. This curve has bent down. In the Colorado River Basin, 
we've successfully used less water. We haven't used enough less water, because Lake Mead's still dropping, but we need to understand why that curve has been down, how that curve has been down, and how we can encourage more of that in a way that sort of preserves the values and the lives of these communities that we so love in the West. And, and I'm optimistic, having seen all these communities be successful that I've been visiting over the last years working on my book, we can do this. So I'm optimistic. So that's why I'm the optimist. So thank you very much. Sometimes it's like Side. The, the left hand side is actual water use. The, the vertical line, the stuff on the right, is what water users projected they would need starting in 2015. What, I'm what the state I'm sorry, what the states projected. Thank you very much for the clarification. Yes, what the states projected. So they thought they would need a lot of water, and everybody said we need a lot of water. They are, in fact. It's being revisited, um, yes, in useful ways. How can I tell you what it's called? It's called protecting the dream. Protecting the what? Preserving. Preserving the dream, yeah. yeah. What I call st staying on the orange line is, is preserving the dream, yeah. John, you mentioned that scarcity indicators matter. Is there any research or Um, I have looked for this research, and, and Southern Nevada Water Authority people say that that is the case. Um, I think that's right, but I haven't seen the research. I don't know. But Pat's not going to yes, and she knows a lot more about this than me. So, so, so you know, the question is, why can't California learn from Arizona and Las Vegas? And, and I, there's a couple of points I would make. First of all, it's really important to disaggregate what we mean by California. California is not a monolith. Um, um, the, there is, a, there is a, uh, another myth that if the talk was a half hour longer, I would spend a lot of time on, which is the myth that California does not regulate its groundwater. In fact, all across Southern California was the earliest and most innovative self-regulation of groundwater basins. So California has done a lot um, in some of its geographies, and, um, and in other geography. And, and so if you look at the coastal urban cities as well, they've done well. Um, California's biggest problems are, are there is its inability to um, come to grips with um, the enormous agricultural um, water use in the San Joaquin Valley, especially the southern San Joaquin Valley which is supported either by imported water that comes through the Delta, as I talked about, um, or um, really deeply unsustainable groundwater pumping. That's the part that California hasn't come to grips with. And I've tried to stay away from California because I'm trying to write a book called Colorado River Basin other than the southern part. So I don't have an answer to why California doesn't do a better job at that. Um, but, but it's important to disaggregate California. I think Southern California um, um, there's a lot of really good innovative models for water management, water conservation. Yeah, 30 percent um, this year. Really, yes, yeah, some excellent success there. Thank you very much. You've done a great job, kind of outlining how uh, we can adapt better for human needs. And I'm wondering, uh, are you looking in your book or your research about how well we are doing with environmental and recreational? So, so one of the, the, the question is, the question is, I've talked about water for human needs. What about environmental and recreational flows? One of the things that, that I spent some time on in the book is Minute 319 in the Delta, which is an example of a model of a success story um, in returning water, in, in bringing the environment as a, as a genuine stakeholder into these discussions. Um, it's an extremely modest effort in terms of the volume of water involved. Um, it shows some process issues because 
Uh, it, it's a great example of how fighting doesn't work because environmental interests tried to litigate the Delta, tried to litigate water down there, they failed. And so a number of really progressive, forward-looking uh, environmentalists found ways to integrate the environmental values and needs into the water manager's needs. So they, you know, Jennifer Pitt, for example, spent a lot of time trying to figure out, well, so what do these water managers really need? How can we structure deals in a way that's collaborative and cooperative that will meet their needs and also put some water into that river channel in the Delta? And I will tell you personally, and this is the beginning and the ending of my book, is you know, standing in that river channel, watching that water flow was a life-changing, moving experience for me, but more importantly for the, the communities down there. Um, and, and it is a human values issue. It's human communities wanting to put this water back and, and learning how to give them a seat at the table. Because what we found is that with sort of relatively modest adjustments in the way the water is managed for the human system for, for farms and cities, you can you can do this, and this is especially, I don't want to say easy, and I, I'm a little bit embarrassed at how poorly I understand the upper basin, but it is easier to do these things in the upper basin because um, water continues to flow through your system on the way to the lower basin. Um, it was much harder to do in the delta, and so I think if you can you know, look at the model of what happened in the delta with minute 319, and we can learn from that, um, there are opportunities. But the key thing is, to, is for the water managers to recognize the need to bring in environmentalists and learn how to have a conversation with the environmentalists to learn how you know, to have those conversations. And there's some really, um, you know, some smart progressive environmentalists work on that side of the issue over here in the upper basin, especially with the economy and the nature of the service and groups like that. One last question. So the, the orange line, are yellow lines, are those lines that are Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the orange line, or now the, the yellow line on the right, is predicated on population growth. Do I have optimism for more water conscious development? And the answer is yes. You see this over and over again. You, can, you, you see the new, the new development in Las Vegas and Albuquerque are both great examples of this, where new stuff uses a lot less water. In fact, the water conservation per capita, that may be the easiest pieces. It's, it's easy to control the development standards, you know, and I think the Southern Nevada Water Authority and its member agencies are pioneers in really strong development standards. Um, that's where an opportunity is. Um, um, but again, you see in all these cities, and this is not just in the West, you go to Seattle and you see the same things, is that um, new development uses less water, every new appliance um, uses less water than the old appliance, which matters, and matters less in a place like Albuquerque and, Las Vegas, where we're putting the water back in the system, like me or the Grand, um, but people's attitudes toward their landscaping can be changed, and attitudes toward landscaping is the biggest piece. Um, so, yeah, I'm optimistic. Thank you. Thanks.